In this movie, I'm going to use a program called GeoGebra to simulate an example of two-dimensional motion. This will serve as a good framework example to talk through terms like speed, instantaneous velocity, average velocity, acceleration, etc. for nonlinear motion. My goal is to get this program to simulate some interesting motion that develops in time, and since time is going to be my variable, the very first thing I need to do is to define it as a variable for this program. This is done by just typing t, and the program asks right away if I want a slider, and I do. I'm also going to adjust the settings of the slider so that I can see times between 0 and 4 seconds. Next I'm going to define a point and I'll stick it at the origin to start. You can see here that the coordinates are listed as 0, 0. But the cool thing about this program is that you can define the coordinates as a function of time. In other words, I'm going to tell GeoGebra how the location of the point should evolve over time. I've decided that my x-coordinate should be 3t minus t squared, and the y-coordinate is simply going to be minus t. GeoGebra immediately calculates these coordinates to minus 1. What's going on here is the timer is set to a time of 1, and when you plug 1 in for t here, you get 2, negative 1. Watch what happens when I pull back the slider and play the animation. GeoGebra is continually calculating the position of the object at different times and showing you an animation of the motion. Now, you can see that the motion bounced here and time is now running in reverse. I'm not crazy about that setup, so I can change that by going to Settings, picking Slider, and instead of asking for oscillation, I can just increase once. And now, when I play the motion, it'll stop at 4 seconds. I'd also like to clean up the way that point looks. And so I'm going to go in and change the point to be orange. And I'd like to show also the trace. And I'll show you what that does. Now when I play the motion, it keeps track of where the object has been and puts little dots all along the path. And this is nice because you can see the motion of the particle. And also, as the thing starts to speed up, you can see the dots get further apart. Now that the motion is set, let's define some terms. I told the program where point A should be as a function of time. Often in physics, you will see a position vector that goes from the origin out to the position of a particle at a particular moment. To make a position vector in GeoGebra, just select the vector function, click on the origin, and point at the point you're interested in. Now when I run the clock backwards and play, you can see this vector that's following A through the motion. The position vector is often denoted by R, so let me make that change, and we have something that looks like a classic position vector in physics. Another thing you might like to do is to find a displacement between two points on the path. Let's define two new points, and I'll define a new vector between the points. And that's going to be the displacement between C and D. Notice that GeoGebra immediately calculates the components of that vector. The meaning is that to go from C to D, it's necessary to go 2.25 units to the left and 1.5 units down. In terms of vectors, displacement is defined as change in position, or delta R, which is equal to RF minus RI. You can think of this graphically in terms of the actual position vectors. Here's RF. And here's RI. To calculate delta R, simply substitute the vectors in component form into this equation. So delta R is equal to 0, negative 3, minus 2.25, minus 1.5. Subtracting by components, we find that delta R is negative 2.25, negative 1.5, exactly as GeoGebra calculated. I'm writing my vectors in the same way that GeoGebra does, but for completeness, I should note that many physics texts will write the vectors in i hat, j hat, k hat notation, and the calculation will look like this in that notation. Although this notation is somewhat antiquated, it's all over physics texts, so you need to be comfortable with it.
Let's stick with the same displacement vector to find average velocity between two points. The average velocity is the displacement or change in position over change in time. If we're looking at the average velocity between C and D, point C occurs at 1.5 seconds and point D occurs at 3 seconds, so the difference between them, or delta T, is 1.5 seconds. And that original displacement vector was negative 2.25, negative 1.5. Dividing, I find that the average velocity is negative 1.5, negative 1 on that interval from 1.5 seconds to 3 seconds. I can put that same average velocity vector into GeoGebra. I'm going to define a new vector from C to D. And then I can just go in and divide by 1.5. Notice that it shows up at the origin. Now, that's a perfectly valid place to be, but it's a little bit more pleasing to have it originating from C. So I'm just going to move it over there by creating a vector from a point. I'll pick point C and then pick the vector, and you can see a new vector has been produced here called V. I'm going to add an av to that. And then I'm going to turn u and the displacement vector off so that you can see the average velocity really well. And there it is. Notice that the values that GeoGebra calculates for the average velocity vector are exactly the same as the ones we calculated a moment ago. How about instantaneous velocity? Instantaneous velocity is defined as the limit as delta t approaches zero of delta r over delta t, which you'll recognize as the derivative of position with respect to time. Let's take point c as our example. This definition is saying that to find instantaneous velocity, you want to pick two points that are incredibly close together find the change in position between them, and then divide by the time between them. Let me zoom in on this point so we can see what that's going to look like. If you look at the points on either side of C, you can see that the displacement vectors would be almost straight down. From this point to C, the displacement vector goes straight down and maybe a little bit to the right. And from C to this point, the displacement vector goes straight down and maybe a little bit to the left. In the limit, as delta t goes to zero, that displacement vector is going to point straight down, which means that the instantaneous velocity is also going to point straight down. Let me zoom back out, and now let's go ahead and take the derivative of the position vector with respect to time. dr by dt is going to be the derivative with respect to time of 3t minus t squared minus t, and that's equal to 3 minus 2t negative 1. I'm going to define a new vector. I'm going to go in and change the coordinates to reflect the calculation I just made for instantaneous velocity. You can see that GeoGebra has placed my new velocity vector at the origin. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to move A to position C, which is what we were talking about earlier. And I'm also going to move this velocity vector so that it shows up right at the point of the position vector. Now that I have the instantaneous velocity vector on here, you can see that indeed it is straight down at 1.5 seconds, exactly as we predicted. Now let me pull back the time slider and I can show you the simulation again. Notice how the instantaneous velocity vector gets shorter as the particle slows down and gets longer again as it speeds up. And it's always tangent to the path of motion. The instantaneous speed of the particle at any moment in time is the length of the instantaneous velocity vector. The average speed is defined as distance over time, and for that you'd actually have to measure the path length over some time interval and then divide by delta t. Last but not least, let's talk about acceleration. Average acceleration is defined as change in velocity over change in time, and this is instantaneous velocity we're talking about. To make this calculation, you need to choose two points along the path and determine what the instantaneous velocity vectors are at each point. Let's use c and d as our examples. Let me pull my time slider back to point D to see what the instantaneous velocity vector is there. I can just scroll down in GeoGebra and see that the instantaneous velocity at point D is minus 3, minus 1. Now let me go back to point C. The instantaneous velocity vector there is 0, negative 1. Putting that all into the equation, negative 3, negative 1, minus 0, negative 1, all over 1.5 seconds, which is the delta t between c and d, is equal to negative 3, 0 over 1.5, which is equal to negative 2, 0. To save a little time, I'm going to skip drawing the average acceleration vector on there, 
but you could do it yourself for practice if you'd like to. Finally, how about instantaneous acceleration? This is defined as the limit as delta t approaches zero of delta v over delta t, and you'll recognize this as the derivative of instantaneous velocity with respect to time. This derivative may be found by taking the derivative of the components of the instantaneous velocity vector. So the instantaneous acceleration is negative two, zero. Let's put that into the simulation. Let me pull back the time slider and run through the simulation. Notice how the acceleration points to the left and doesn't change in length at all. That's because it's a constant acceleration. Remember the acceleration we found was negative two comma zero and that doesn't have any dependence on time. It's also worth noticing that this result is exactly the same as the previous one where we calculated the average acceleration between C and D. Whenever the instantaneous acceleration is constant, the average acceleration between any two points on the path will be exactly equal to the instantaneous acceleration. The conceptual meaning of a constant acceleration vector is that at any point along the path, the tip of the velocity vector is being pulled consistently to the left. On this part of the path, it's mostly a change in direction that we're seeing, and down here the velocity vector is mostly changing in speed. It can be kind of difficult to see what constant acceleration really means when the velocity vector is moving along with the particle, so let me show a second velocity vector with its tail fixed at the origin. I've gotten rid of everything else in the simulation except for these two instantaneous velocity vectors, the one that tracks along with A and the one that's fixed at the origin. Now I'll run the simulation and notice that these two vectors are exactly the same in the sense that they have the same magnitude and direction at any point in time. I'm going to run the simulation again, and if you just focus on the instantaneous velocity vector that's fixed at the origin, you can see that the tip slides along at a constant rate along a straight line. This is what it means to have a constant acceleration. I'll conclude with a summary page of all these terms as they apply to nonlinear motion. The best way to internalize all of this, though, is to try some problems. Be sure to think really carefully about your results. When you find an average acceleration, draw it and ask yourself if it makes sense. If you get an instantaneous acceleration vector, think about how it's representing the change in velocity over each time interval and ask yourself whether that makes sense. Getting used to using vectors can be a little intimidating at first, but if you keep thinking about the results and push yourself to make sense of them, your comfort level will improve pretty quickly.